And to wrap up everything, <clears throat> talking about measuring cyanotoxins, uh, Dan, <clears throat> Dan Orr from our Water Pollution Control Laboratory, Fishing, Fish and Wildlife Laboratory, that we're all from, the, you know, Pete and you know, Dave Crane over there, the head of the, head of the lab, or something like that. Like, <laughs> either Pete, Pete or Dave, or maybe they do it together. But anyway, so he's going to give us an update on um, analysis of cyano, um, <clears throat> bacteria, I mean cyanotoxins. And uh, Dan has only been with us for less than a year now, right? Or has it been a year already? And then before that, you were down in Region 6, Fish and Wildlife. So he's been Fish and Wildlife for a while. All right, well, I get the privilege and dismal position of talking to you guys after all these great stories about uh, cyanotoxins. Um, so, like you said, I'm from the WPCL. We have a few different mandates that we follow over out here at Rancho Cordova. Um, we do a variety of things. Um, a lot of us, our work is geared towards a uh, spill response, um, do the uh, feeds bioassessment work, and also um, responding to whatever uh, other state agencies may need in terms of technical assistance, and that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I'll be telling you where we're at at our laboratory in terms of cyanotoxin analysis, um, sort of just as a framework to get you thinking of what are the things you should consider as uh, after these other talks, everyone's sitting there with their ears going, up, how do I do this in my river? And this is my question, how do I get at it? And some of the technical things to keep in mind um, when you're framing those questions. Um, so I can skip through a lot of these uh, intro slides here, but I do want to point out a couple of things uh, before I just launch into a bunch of chemical jargon on you. Um, so this uh, here is Microsystem LR. Um, I'm going to mention this group here. Um, you can be referring to this as the ADA group. That acronym stands for a really long chemical name that would pretty much go across this whole slide. So I'm not going to explain that acronym. That's the ADA group. Um, it's a, uh, a hepatopeptide, so there's um, several peptides here. If you hear me say like MCLR, RR, I'm talking about these other peptides changing. That's the difference between those. Um, and Kim, uh, I think, covered a lot of the stuff on this toxicity. Um, but from a chemical perspective at the lab, um, to some extent, these thresholds um, that come from regulatory bodies, such as many people in this room, becomes uh, an analytical target. Um, how low do we need it to be able to detect to answer that concentration question for you in a relative way? And if you're going off the uh, World Health Organization's guideline for drinking water of one microgram per liter, you want to be in our boat about 10 times lower than that, so you want to be looking for a method that can get you down to about 0.1 uh, micrograms per liter or parts per billion. Um, I also want to point out that uh, OEHA has uh, recommended recreation action levels. I think we saw those up uh, on one of the previous presentations. Um, depending on which toxin you're talking about, that may be lower than that blue threshold. Um, so you can't expect that these numbers may move around, um, and we may need to respond to that in the future. Uh, some of the analytical challenges that you look at with microsystems, um, as you've heard previously, there's a large variety of uh, microsystems, um, over 90. Um, there are, are standard methods. Most of the folks talking to you today are probably testing these in similar ways. Um, but many of these methods are, are more a research type of method suited to an investigative um, type of question, and uh, we're moving into more regulatorily useful numbers now. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, everyone here in the government, nobody's worried about how much this costs, right? So, uh, always looking for the cheapest way to get the job done. Um, and we're very curious about, uh, some of them mentioned, which of these genera are actually producing the toxins. Um, so this is someone else's uh, information here. I stole this from the World Health Organization, um, showing you um, some of those analytical methods that are available and comparing how selective they are, um, meaning how sure are you that's that particular microsystem you're talking about versus their sensitivity, how small amount of it can I tell you confidently is there. Um, and I made a couple little additions, a couple little additions to their slide. Pointing out, I'm going to be talking today to you about um, ELISA or enzyme linked immunosorbent assays. Uh, pretty sensitive, actually quite sensitive, not that selective, and I'll explain that in detail. Um, LCMS, we heard about a little bit earlier. Um, at 
the lab we're using, LCMS, MS, I believe my, the last speaker probably is as well. Um, that's way out here. It's quite selective, uh, very, very sensitive, uh, but I do want to point out this is probably actually undoubtedly the most expensive way of going about it. Um, so what we're currently offering in WPCL um, is the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay um, using that ADA group that I showed you on the microsystem. Um, we're particularly interested in detecting that portion because it's constant across the vast majority of these toxins. So that's not that portion of the molecule that's changing. Um, we can do that in fresh or seawater. Uh, we need to know in advance at seawater, so that's something to be thinking about. Um, we do the LCMSMS, which is uh, very quantitative. Right now we do that in water and a few tissues, um, filet, um, from fish, liver, or heart. A uh, little bit of the thunder got stolen, but those, uh, that lovely otter story, those livers were where that was found. Um, and I believe James Crane was doing that work. Uh, right now by LCMS, we can do nine congeners. I'll talk about those later. Nodularin, okadiac acid, and demoic acid. Don't think we've talked about those today. Those are um, generally marine toxins, but sometimes freshwater. Um, and these types of toxins are often called paralytic shellfish poisons. So when you hear about um, poisons from consuming shellfish, this is often what you're talking about. Uh, we also have an antitoxin A method, that's a receptor binding assay. I will talk about that as well. And we do this in LCMS, MS, but only in freshwater. So why are these the ones that we chose to work on? Um, we report the adequate ELISA as a total, and it is selected for the common structural element, as I mentioned. It's only semi-quantitative. Um, and what I mean by that is this is going, if in your sample you have a mixture of microsystems, these all look the same in the perspective of this test. So while you can quantify how many molecules with that ADA group are in that sample, I cannot tell you which one based on that test. Um, one of the, the big advantages of this is it's very fast. Um, turnaround times uh, right now at the lab are somewhere between four and seven days generally. Um, and it's a relatively low cost on the order of $100 to $150 a sample um, compared to mass spectrometry, which is roughly uh, four times that much. Um, other places may be able to do that cheaper, but the government rate, that's where we're at these days. Um, we do recommend that if you have a positive sample resort, you would want to follow that up with LCMS MS. So regardless of where you get this work done, if you get an ELISA sample, keep in mind that that may be reported as um, microsystem LR equivalents, but to be really sure, you would want to follow that up with LCMS. So if you're working off that WHO regulatory threshold, um, make sure at some point you've gotten to this so that you can say confidently that's microsystem LR. Um, there are a variety of ELISA kits available, um, and I just want to put in your head as you're, as you're making your plans, there's differences between what those offer. Um, no ELISA is going to be specific to MCLR. So if you're trying to work off of a water quality objective for MCLR, this will give you an idea, but not an exact number. Um, the additive that we're using, um, we largely chose it because it has broad cross-reactivity. What I mean by that is it um, is the, has equivalent sensitivity to all of the microsystem congeners I have available. Um, and so you're unlikely to be missing one. Um, the direct monoclonal is, is pretty good, but a few of those congeners it's not that sensitive for. So there is some potential that you could be, for example, having microsystem YR in your sample and, and not pick that up. Um, the ADA tends to be a little biased on the high side in some situations. There's some reports of false positive in tissues, so bear that in mind. Um, in contrast, the direct monoclonal is going to be biased low, um, but it is a little cheaper. Um, some other things to consider. Um, depending on where you go to a laboratory, um, if you're in the position that you're running this himself, yourself, I recommend you run everything in triplicate. Or if you're sending out to a lab, ask them to do that. Um, often, uh, when you're running this type of an assay, I'm talking about three of these little wells, and you do the little test three times, it's not uncommon for one in three of these things to be a little bit off. And so if you've really got to depend on that number, I would uh, encourage you to make sure they're doing that three times. 
Um, if you're running itself, be careful about the temperature. Um, at the lab, we're actually not recommending folks do the field tests for that reason. Um, if it's hot, you may get a higher result than you would otherwise. If it's cold, you may not get a detection when you should. Um, how many wells there are really drives that cost. Um, so if you go out and get a quote from labs and one of them comes back, I don't know, say 30% cheaper, <laughs> it may be that they're only running that in double. So that's something to keep in mind um, since we don't, uh, for the swamp folks, have quality objectives. Uh, who runs it's going to matter. Um, there's a very key importance to how fast you get this done. It's very time sensitive. And so depending on your analyst, it may go bad. Um, the manufacturer may be um, reporting QA to you that's based on how much color is reported by the instrument, but there's a lot of um, regression that goes into calculating that. Um, so bear that in mind too. Um, how they do the calculation is gonna really influence how good your result is. So um, we recommend that ELISA generally for screening. If you're doing something like an ambient monitoring, it's real fast and cheap um, and that you could probably get at that answer if you need that high-end quantification to go as low as you can and you need to know which specific microsystem you're talking about uh, I would suggest you go with uh, the mass spec method um, this right now is a list of things that you're going to get from us if you requested that analysis um, I often get asked by folks okay so if there's 90 of them why can you only tell me about that list of nine uh, these things are produced in a big map that looks like this not by me um, and so it's extracted out of a big algae culture. Um, and so it's pretty limited as to which ones you can get a hold of. So what that means is if you run an ELISA test, um, you'll get a result that is responsive to essentially all of those variants. If you do mass spec, we can only tell you the ones that somebody can isolate for us. So depending on your question, that may matter. Um, there's a lot more expertise that goes into running this and a lot more time. Um, so it will be more expensive. Um, other things to consider when you're going out to sample, what should you be worried about? Um, we recommend that you uh, sample in high density polyethylene plastic. Um, I've heard folks worried that the microsystem absorbs the glass. It's not that much, it's about 4%. Um, and part of the process is lysing those cells and glass doesn't hold up well with that. Um, you want to get at least 250 milliliters if you're going to send this to us or another lab uh, to ensure they're going to be able to get that done. Um, depth really depends on your question. Um, forgive me if one of the other guys mentioned it earlier, uh, but um, you heard about uh, both benthic and water quality water column microcystis. Uh, microcystis can actually control its buoyancy. So while you may see a big service out on that and go up and grab that and get a good result, there are situations where you may come to a lake and not see that. Um, so in the background here, here's an example. This is a, a lake near Oakland. And there's a little bit of algae mat here, but you're not seeing a massive bloom on the surface. Um, this day is actually uh, one of the highest results I've gotten so far. Um, so the lake looked clear. You don't see a huge bloom. Um, but actually what happened a few days previously is they treated this lake with algae side. So those microcystis cells die, they lyse, they release the toxin they had built up in the cells, and that was pretty hot that day. Um, so I'm really happy about you know, wearing my uh, you know, super safe sampling sneakers right here. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit too. So there may not be a visible bloom just like this. Um, conversely, you may have a huge bloom of algae, and it's um, another species, or a strand of microcystis that doesn't produce the toxin. So um, don't just assume from that. There are some other field measurements you might want to think about. Um, dissolved oxygen, pH, and conductivity are really helpful. Conductivity is going to tell your lab, is this something they're running like salt water or fresh water? Um, DO, is this eutrophic or not? And pH is going to be pretty important to how stable your sample is. Um, with that, whatever lab you're using, just call them and ask, um, you know, what should I be doing for my sampling in this case? If they won't help you, uh, I will. So give me a call. Um, so I mentioned my super safe sampling sneakers when I was at that lake that looked fine so I wasn't too worried, um, but luckily that other fellow had some waders on him. Um, there's kind of two routes you're going to be worried about. 
Um, if you're looking at wet biomass or a water sample, you know, don't eat it. Um, or if you get this on your skin, it can cause a rash. But where in both cases, in terms of both dry cells and wet, what you're really worried about is inhalation. Um, so what you can do to control that, if you're the person that's got to go out and sample this, don't fall in, wear a life vest. Um, waterproof boots and gloves, no super safe sneakers. Um, work when the water's calm. And one thing I added, this is someone else's slide, but carry some bleach. Um, if you two and a half to 10% bleach for 30 minutes, I'll get rid of most of that uh, toxicity. So for me, this is you know the marker I use to label the vial, or um, I broke a bottle in the back of my truck, and I don't want to be sweating all day, and I get this on my hands. Um, you can wipe that down with some bleach, and about 30 minutes later, you're fairly safe. Um, dry biomass is a big risk, um, just because the concentrations can be much higher. So gloves and coveralls, you could consider just wetting that down and sending the lab a wet sample instead of a dry one, so you can't risk to inhale that. All right, uh, the other toxin we're running right before our testing now is anatoxin A. Uh, it's right there, you, this was mentioned by a few other folks. Uh, there's that action level, so you're wanting to test it gets you down to at least nine. Um, uh, for that, one of the methods we use is a receptor binding assay. A um, little bit different, so this is looking at the acetylcholine receptor, the nerve receptor, which this toxin binds and causes issues. Um, I'll skip over some of these reporting limits. They're pretty low, they get you down below that level. Um, if you're the folks that need to run this, be really careful about temperature sensitivity. Um, they're commercial kits, but when you buy them, they're gonna tell you you need to um, incubate your test at 37 degrees C. Um, they may not warn you that it can re-evaporate at that point, so make sure you've got a cover on it. Um, also, um, there's an issue with drift control. Um, to make it short, if you're running a really big well all at once, uh, the well at the beginning is going to look lower in concentration than the one at the end. Um, so this is where, how good is that analyst? Do they know to tell you, only give me six samples at a time? Um, just have a conversation with them about that. And uh, with LCMS, our reporting limit is actually the same. Uh, currently, we only do that by direct injection, which means I can't do seawater. Um, but if you need seawater, we could do that by receptor binding assay. Um, so that's quite doable as well. Um, sampling considerations with anatoxin A, most of it down here is what you just saw before. Um, but there's a couple of other issues. Um, anatoxin A is pretty light sensitive. Um, so you either want brown glass or that polyethylene I talked about to be brown. Um, also, sample pH can impact the degradation rate. Um, if your sample's acidic, you're losing a lot of that toxin in the time that it's gonna take you to get a sample to a lab. So if you have the capability to do it, check that pH, and if it's high, um, either bring that pH down or let the lab know. Um, if it's not our lab, they may be able to tell you something to do. You could freeze it or they can help you out with that. Um, so those are the tests we're at now. Um, the next things we're looking at are more tissue methods. Um, down here's a picture of the, a liver from one of those otters that was mentioned earlier. So that was done at WPCL, um, but we're looking to expand our capabilities of doing that and um, try to convert that over to that ELISA test um, to bring costs down. And also, um, this is still somewhat of a research-based method but get that to something that's uh, got the QA that we could use for regulatory decisions. Along with that, looking at other protocols um, and uh, looking to respond to whatever regulations um, come out of groups like CCHAP or our Swamp C team. Um, glad to be starting to be involved with that. But uh, you know, if those thresholds drop or your questions change, uh, we'll be looking to respond to that. Um, specifically, uh, expanding the suite of toxins that we offer. Um, and we're also interested in, in the ability to identify species either by microscopy or, or possibly by qPCR. Um, it's a um, genetic-based method, and the advantage there is the ability to test if the strain produces the toxin, if it has the gene for that, as compared to is this a strain that doesn't produce the toxin. Okay, well, I won't keep you from lunch unless you have questions. <laughs> I want to get you to lunch, so um, if you have a question, buy a lunch. <laughs> <laughs>